So on balance, I think this is an environment 2014 where the U.S. domestic side not very interesting, the U.S. foreign policy side problematic. When I think about China, it's kind of the opposite. China, for the first time is re in a long time, is really in play domestically. Xi Jinping has done more in terms of reform in the last seven, eight months than we had seen in 20 years in China. That really matters. Those things are overdue, right? Uh, Anti-corruption, which they're really starting to engage in. And no, not his own family, but, but serious <laughs> baby steps, baby steps. No, but seriously, the fact that they're going after folks who run state-owned enterprises, who are involved in the energy complex in a big way, the fact that they're going to squeeze them on capital, the fact they're going to go around the country and actually make heads of provinces uh, deal with market-based incentives and metrics in terms of how they're going to be perform the performance reviews and grades they're going to get for their next step in the Communist Party, that's a big deal. The fact that we see a real effort to start opening up the financial sector in terms of the way that oversight is done and wealth management project, products that don't actually work and shadow lending, and they're going to start bankrupting some banks. Those are important things for the Chinese government to do if they want to restructure their economy towards higher value, consumer-driven entrepreneurship. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a long time, but they're starting in a way that in the Hu Jintao, Wen Bao era, they weren't really starting. Now, at the same time that they're doing that, they are creating losers in the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, why had they not been serious about anti-corruption before? Well, because these are powerful people in an anti-democratic state. And might you not want to annoy them? Because that could bite you. So the other thing that Xi Jinping is doing is political reform, not liberalizing reform. Right? But consolidating more power in his hands, creating a national security council that's based a little bit on the American model, but instead of being foreign policy oriented, it's primarily internal security oriented. Why would he do that, you ask? Because if these reforms go badly, if they aren't liked, then he has the ability to bring down the hammer. Right? That, hence the consolidation. Why, why would he make life more difficult for dissidents if he's an economic reformer? Why would he make it harder for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Bloomberg to report? Well, precisely because he is starting to engage in reform. In other words, I think this is real, but I don't think this is uniformly positive. It is destabilizing. There's volatility. The Chinese are embarking in the next step of an unprecedented historical experiment. Never been done this quickly on this kind of scale. They may succeed. We all hope they do. But if they start to fail, we have no idea what the effects of that are going to be. That creates big risk internally in China. I think the China-US relationship is on balance moving in a better direction. Now, how does that comport with the fact that I just said US foreign policy is in decline? Well, actually, senior Chinese leaders like this new Obama administration. Hillary's gone. Kurt Campbell's gone. There's no more pivot. There's no more economic statecraft. Th this is a group that they think they're not going to get punished by, right? The hardliners on China, like them or don't like them, are basically out. I, I think that the China relationship um, is, th these are guys that want to have, in the context of a more difficult economic environment domestically with more challenges, they'd like the U.S.-China relationship to be relatively stable. So they announce a bilateral investment treaty that they want to engage in with the U.S. The U.S. has been trying to get them to do that for a long time a multilateral trade and services agreement they're willing to be a part of, for example. They are willing to go after Japan, but they're only doing it because they think that they can drive a wedge between the US and Japan. And so far, they've been somewhat successful in doing that. The American response to Abe's, Prime Minister Abe's visit to Yasukuni War Shrine, the American response, Vice President Biden's response to the air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, very clearly differentiated from what Japanese Prime Minister Abe is doing. That's interesting. Right? A little worried about Japan, China in that regard, right? Maybe more than a little worried. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the US Japan China relationship is in many ways becoming analogous to the US Israel Iran relationship. Do I really mean that? Yeah. In the sense that we like Israel more than anyone else in the Middle East, it's the closest relationship. But we're much more concerned on balance about a stable, relationship with Iran right now. That's the priority. We want to fix that. And 
while we're worried about Iran, the Israelis are much more worried about Iran than we are. What does that sound like? Right? We like the Japanese, but we see the China issue as more important and more potential downside that we want to avoid, so we try to balance. We worry about China, but Japan worries about China a lot more. Well, historically, in that dynamic in the Middle East, the, that's when the Israelis start to actually provoke a little more because it's like, ah, the Americans are going to forget about us, so we need to ensure that we actually continue to chest beat a little bit, right? Might that be happening in Japan a little bit? Could be. 